Wow, look at all that fellowshipping going on right now. Good morning, church. Now, I know you all that are sitting here are familiar to why we wear the mask in the congregation, but this is for you at home. Uh, we do wear masks here. We are social distancing. And so I'm inviting you to join us in our worst morning, Sunday morning worship. I know you go to the bank. I know you go to the grocery store. I know you go to the doctor's office. And I heard somebody say today that it's more space in here than it is in a doctor's office. And we have the social distancing. So we do have the masks for you. Jade and I take them off. Because we're far away enough from everyone where it's not, it's the, the, the distance still makes the sanctuary safe for all. So with that having been said, church, uh, I just want to say that it has been an exceptional week for me. Exceptionally difficult. I say that to say this, that because of God's faithfulness, he brought me through it. And so what I'd like to do is just start today with a prelude to our worship with the idea that we can trust God to bring us through our difficulties. And we should praise him both in and out of season, meaning good times and bad. And so I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet and just sing a chorus with me of I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. In the Lord, I will trust in the Lord. Tell them, I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. And isn't that a wonderful mantra? Just everybody say it. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. And you know what that does when you trust in the Lord? It gives you confidence. Confidence in his faithfulness. Confidence in his power. Amen. Confidence in his ability to perform. Amen. Amen. Ready? Okay. I'm not a warrior. I'm not afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to do. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse. Because broken people are exactly who you use. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy. And made him a king. So I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror. Because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, come on, to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, so give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. 
so I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to face my giants with confidence. church. Good morning. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Man, the Lord gave us a beautiful day to get out today, didn't he? Huh? Yes. I'm so grateful to see you. I've been blessed already this morning. Uh, there's enough people starting to come back into to the body that I haven't had a chance to greet everyone, but I did meet some new guests, some new friends, and I'm so grateful that you're here to worship with us today. Let me uh, uh, invite you to connect with us, finding a card in the pocket of the seat in front of you that looks a little bit like this. Uh, take just a moment during the service, if you would, please, to uh, fill out a little bit about yourself, whatever you feel comfortable in sharing. And uh, if there's any prayer requests, there's a small place on the back uh, to do that. And uh, at the end of the service, take this card. And since we're not passing anything around, whatever, there's some uh, offering boxes at either door. And at the end of the service, you can just drop that card right in there. If you have any need that I need to get with you, please indicate that on the card. Uh, again, a prayer need, uh, a personal visit, and so forth. So uh, uh, we're grateful that you're here as our guest today. I want to ask you to open up the bulletin with me to look at a couple key points in there. First, before I do that, yesterday I had... The, the rich blessing of doing a discover class. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a business meeting that immediately follows. It's our uh, third quarterly business meeting of the year. And so I'll share a little bit more about that. But at the same time, we had what's called a church appreciation day. In layman's terms, that's work day. But those who appreciate their church will often come out and, uh, and give it a little bit of love and care. I don't even know all that showed up yesterday as I was busy, but I just want to say I know that there were some cars and trucks in the parking lot, and I'm grateful for what you did. And I just want to give you an applause. Thanking you. You are appreciated. Uh, in your bulletin, you ought to see an insert, which is, of course, a listening guide. It's to be used as a learning tool so that you can follow through uh, today's sermon message from a, uh, a series we're called, I Believe in God, But. And today we're going to address the fairness of God. I believe in God, but I don't, be I, I don't, I don't believe he's fair. And God's word that we're going to be looking at today is Psalm 103, Psalm 103. So you may want to open your Bibles or your uh, uh, electronic devices to that passage, and we'll get there a little bit later on. If you do not bring a Bible, you're still invited to read along with us. I'll read from the same translation as the blue Bible that you find under the seats, and you just want to turn to page 428, 428. And you can take this listening guide and bookmark it for uh, later on. Um, I have an update or a correction on some information that I've been sharing with y'all. I'm going to assume that it was due to a lack of interest that Citrus County School Board canceled the uh, September 18 training session. But either way, what I've been promoting for you to be a part of is the central, at the, to serve the Central Ridge Elementary School, the training that's necessary from the Citrus County School Board, at least what we understand right now is being postponed till October 16. So please don't give up. We need everyone on board who is able to join us. You can't be a part of any ministry inside 
the doors of the elementary school if you don't have the proper credentials to get in that door. So that's really what this is all about. But anyway, if you were still thinking about September 18, it's been scratched, and, uh, and we'll look forward to that October date. Um, tomorrow is Labor Day. I remember before the ministry, that meant that was a day of labor for me. But uh, a lot of things are going to be closed down, including the school. So for my prayer warriors that meet on Mondays and Tuesdays at Central Ridge Elementary, we're not going to meet. I still expect you to pray, but we're not going to meet at the school. But I will see you there Tuesday morning at 930 and we'll resume the prayer. If you have never been a part of the prayer experience at Central Ridge Elementary School up on Citrus Springs Boulevard, join us. Would you please? It's a great experience to watch the parents bring their kids in and, and, uh, um, and pray for them and pray for some of the needs of that school. And every once in a while... One of the administrators of the school will come out and pray with us. So 9.30 on Tuesday morning at uh, the front door of uh, Central Ridge Elementary School. One other thing uh, that I want to, to mention is that we, as we slowly start to recuperate from COVID, uh, if you still want to be a part of a life group, your life group just kind of fell apart. Or you just haven't participated. There's two things going on right now. There is a Zoom uh, a, a life group that meets on Thursday nights at 7, and there's room to jump in on that. Let me know if that's something that you can do. But particularly, ladies, pay attention. The Roses of Sharon that are being uh, led by Ramona Green is resuming this Wednesday at the Franklin Hall at noon. Wednesday, September 9 at noon for ladies. Uh, and so uh, I want you to know that that's getting back together. And I'm grateful for stepping out in faith, being a part of, of uh, what God wants us to do. And we cannot stay away from God's word too long and the fellowship of other uh, Christians. So I want to encourage you to keep that in mind. I thought today was a short announcement day, but let's go get to uh, pray and to worship. I hope you came today with something big to give. Oh, I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about the love that's filled in your heart that God put there. And we get to unload back on him to say, Lord, this is how much I love you. And God has actually given us a wonderful vehicle to, uh, to enable us to do that. And that's called music. And even while we're out without musical instrument, in, instrumentation, it actually does something special. It's called acapella, right? Acapoco, whatever you want to call it. But it actually draws our attention to what? The lyrics. You kids have a hard time fussing over music when there isn't any melody. But the lyrics will help to open our eyes and, and focus them on the Lord. So that's where I want your concentration to be here in the next few minutes. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. Love you and adore you for who you are. Oh, Lord, it is a privilege to be in your house. Oh, let us never to take this for granted. And perhaps for some people who are back into the house of the Lord for the first time in a long time will realize, oh, that shutdown was horrible. Lord, I've missed the fellowship of my brothers and sisters in Christ, but more so in, the, in their presence, I've missed being in your presence. And so, Lord, help to shape my mind in the way I think, my heart in the way I feel, and just to open up those floodgates and pour out love and gratitude 
thanksgiving and adoration for who you are in my life and all that you give me, all that you do for me. I just want to say thank you, Lord. This is how much I love you. I need your help, Holy Spirit, to prepare the hearts of the people for the message that's coming down the pike from Psalm 103. So, Lord, prepare our hearts today to truly worship you, to give you worth the value of who you are to us. I pray this in the name above all names, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. So everyone say, our God. Our God. Now, own it. Our God. Our God. Now, anytime you start a sentence with our God, you can have confidence that God is working things out for your good. And you want to know why? Because he's your God. He loves you and he wants his best for you. Amen. Our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Thank you, Jesus. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? What can stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Amen, amen. The angels in heaven are rejoicing, church, because we are having a glorious time in the Lord. Indeed, we are. You are making a joyful noise, and I love you. It's excellent. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's keep going. Forget about the talking. What a friend. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. And I want you to think about that. What does that mean to you? What a friend I have. In Jesus. You can see my excitement. Let me hear yours. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Every 
everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Bless you, Sister J. Amen. Jesus knows. Jesus cares. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. Thank you. You restore every heart that is broken. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's 
your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only lord let us pray dear heavenly father we thank you lord for this opportunity to assemble ourselves we have been able to lift our voices making a joyful noise unto you O god for you are so worthy lord you are so worthy and we will bless you lord with our hearts, with our souls, with our minds. We will love you, Lord, and we will seek your face. We ask, oh God, now that as we prepare for this service, that you remind us that we can trust you, that you remind us that we can have confidence in you. And even when we don't feel like we have a place where we can actually disagree with you, we thank you for your mercy. Because, <laughs> Lord, who am I to give you advice? And so I ask, oh Lord, when those moments do occur, that you would forgive me. Forgive us, Lord, for any unfaithfulness. Forgive us, Lord, for any doubts. We are flesh. We are human. We are prone to error. But we also know that we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. That can teach us and guide us and help us to walk in the kingdom of God in the way that you would have us to go. So we just ask, oh God, that you would bless the rest of this service. Open our eyes. That we might see what you are doing, Lord. Open our ears. That we might receive your word this day. And plant it deep within our hearts. That we might amplify it in our lives. That people will see our works, Lord. Inspired by you. But that your name receives the glory and the honor and the praise. Continue to strengthen our pastor. And the days ahead as we plan for moving forward, Lord. We have confidence and trust in you that things will be according to your will and this i pray in jesus name let the church say amen thank you yvette and jade praise the lord, praise the lord. amen all right A couple has tried so hard to conceive a child, and when they do, oh, it brings such great tears of, of joy. 
But even after the mother has taken great care of her, uh, of her health throughout her pregnancy, the infant dies at birth. And now they shed tears of, of a broken heart. And you can hear them say that, you know, there are mothers who will abort their children and there are mothers who have more babies than they can adequately take care of. So why can't we have a baby to love and care for? Life isn't fair. And people work hard in their offices, in factories, on construction sites, building products, providing services to earn a living for themselves and for their families. And then COVID strikes and things shut down. Or they find themselves in a situation where the fat cat CEOs um, either neglectfully mismanage their company's finances or even criminally embezzle from the company. And all along, these fat cat CEOs live in luxuries with several multi-million dollar homes and planes and boats and they get off scot-free while their employees who desperately need a weekly paycheck are laid off in cutbacks. A young girl or young boy is sexually, mentally, or physically abused by a father or an uncle, perhaps even the family pastor or priest. And that person is, is supposed to be someone that the child can trust their life in. And, and this evil adult has violated the innocence of the child and perhaps even scarred them for life. How can anything be so unfair as that? Life isn't fair. And that's unquestionably true. Life isn't fair. Sometimes the pain in our life becomes so great and we just want to blame someone. And, and so we blame God. And we scream out, God isn't fair. If God was fair, then why do the unrighteous seem to prosper even as the faithful suffer? If God is fair, why doesn't he do something about all the injustices in the world? Today, the fairness of God is, is our focus. And for many people who don't know God, this is their anthem. God isn't fair. And if you're one who says, I believe in God, but I don't believe he's fair, friend, I hope that you'll be open to what the Bible has to say about uh, the fairness of God. For many of us, we say we believe in God, but we live as though he doesn't exist. So we call Christian atheism. We say we believe in God, but we live as though he doesn't exist. But because you're here today, praise the Lord. And for those people who are watching online, perhaps it's because you're seeking to know him. And yet what I've already spoken about has touched a nerve with you. And I assure you, even as it has with me. You remember something you, painful that's in your life. Perhaps you're going through something very painful right now. And, and so the fairness of God is a real issue that you're grappling with. Unanswered pain spills out all throughout the Bible too, friends. Consider Job. Oh boy, that guy, did he ever suffer, right? A righteous man at that. Doesn't seem very fair that a man like Job, uh, that God would allow Satan to take advantage of him just to settle an argument. Then in the New Testament, God empowered John the Baptist to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. And John was an honest, upstanding, upright man who, who lived in every way to honor God. 
God even chose John, of all people, to baptize the Lord Jesus in, in the Jordan River. And yet for the whims of a cruel and evil young woman, Herod's stepdaughter got John's head delivered to her on a platter. God did nothing to protect John, a faithful follower. What about Jesus? How fair was it that, that the Son of God, who is perfect in every way, was mocked, beaten to a pulp, crucified on a, a cross? And then even on top of that, Pontius Pilate re released a notorious, murderous, revolutionary thief called Barabbas, which, by the way, that word means Son of God. The innocent man is condemned and tortured while the guilty criminal was set free. How can that be fair? How can God be so unfair? You sit there trying to process through uh, the process, the pain that you're suffering at the hands of someone else's sin. And even when you pray for God's help, it only seems to get worse. Psalm 103 is a psalm of David. The key verses that, that we'll see in this passage that will help to answer some of the tough questions that we're looking at are verses 8 to 12. But I'd like for us to begin at the beginning, to start so that we might be able to get a, a complete feel of the psalmist's heart. So at this time, with your Bibles open to Psalm 103, it's in the Old Testament, or as I gave you the page number of the church Bible, 428, I'm reading from the same uh, translation as the church Bible, the NIV. And if you would stand with me as you are able uh, to honor the reading of God's word. Beginning in the first verse of Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, I do pray, as I mentioned before, that our hearts and minds are open to receive what you have to teach us from your word, depending upon fully the work of the Holy Spirit who may be dwelling within us. And perhaps you might even illuminate a little bit about those whom the Holy Spirit does not indwell, but they are watching on or listening to, to this message. It is the question of our culture, our society today. Why is God so unfair? So Lord, help us to see through your eyes today to understand your perspective so that we might be in line with what is really true. And we pray that you were pleased 
by our response to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. Verses 1 to 5 of Psalm 103 are so personal that some scholars will view them as, as the first stanza of the, of the psalm. But from this point on, verses 6 to 18, David seems to be talking about God's grace. What he's actually doing here is talking about God, reminding himself and reminding us today what God is like. He is answering that question that we might be uh, wanting to ask ourselves, what is God like that we should praise him? That's what we've been doing here this morning already, church. Amen. Amen. So David tells us in verse 6, God works righteousness and justice in, uh, for, for the oppressed. In verse 8, that God is compassionate and, and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Verse 9, that he does not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And verse 10, I believe, is one of the key uh, verses of our passage our text today he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities basically all these statements collectively are variations of one single truth about God it's the first point of your listening guide is this God is gracious or merciful he is gracious or merciful. The absolute truth about God is that God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you agree with me. If you do not agree with me, I hope that you're open to something to change uh, before, before too long. Because friends, when you've been hurt, when you've been, watch this, God cares for each one of us. He cares for each one of us. When we hurt, he hurts. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh. He knows more about our physical and emotional suffering and pain than you and I ever will know. And so he knows exactly how we feel. And David writes in verse 8 that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding. In love. And then in Matthew's gospel alone, uh, we read the words about Jesus that he, that he, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Um, Matthew 9, when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed the, uh, their sick. Uh, chapter 14 of Matthew. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately they received sight and followed him. Matthew 20. We're going to have to come back to verse 8 in just a few minutes, but here's another truth about God that we need to understand today. God comforts us in our pain. He comforts us in our pain. Uh, Isaiah 49 verse 13, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on, the, on his afflicted ones. Just to know that God is with us is comforting. Amen? Amen. That, that certainly has proven itself. It certainly has to, to me, when a, like for instance, when a person is, is preparing to go into major surgery. Have you ever been there? Uh, we, we tend to get a little nervous, a little scared sometimes, but prayer gives us the peace that, as a reminder of God's love and care. And if you might be fortunate to have a, a pastor, a fellow Christian, or even so fortunate to have a Christian surgeon who will pray with you, all oh, the statistics are clear. They, they help us to understand that a patient has, has come out of uh, surgery much stronger uh, because as a result of God's comforting and healing. Amen. And so the Bible says all this good stuff about God. Well, if indeed he wrote it, shouldn't we expect that to be true? But, all right. So show me goodness. 
Show me goodness. Okay, I'll show you goodness. What was one time, my dear friends, in modern history when a great tragedy struck the United States of America and the people cried out, where is God? It was 9-11, wasn't it? 9-11. This Friday is September 11. It marks the 19th anniversary of that tragic day, a day that we swore that we would never forget. Let me read to you a quote from a website, believe it or not, called Swap Meet Dave. SwapMeetDave.com. This is what, what they write. I quote, Where was God on 9-11 when the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were attacked? He was discouraging people from taking those four flights. Together, those jet planes could accommodate more than 1,000 passengers, and yet there were only 266 on board. He was on those four flights, giving the terrified passengers the ability to stay calm. Not one of the people who was called by a loved one on one of those hijacked planes mentioned that the passengers were panicked or that there was any screaming in the background. And on one of those flights, God gave strength to the passengers to overcome the hijackers. God was also busy creating obstacles to prevent people who worked in the World Trade Center from getting to work on time. The work had begun, uh, the work day had begun, more than 50,000 people worked in those two towers, yet only 20,000 were at their desks. On that beautiful morning, God created scores of unexpected traffic delays, uh, uh, subway delays, commuter train delays. A PATH train packed with commuters was stopped at the signal just short of the World Trade Center and was able to return to Jersey City. Far more meetings were scheduled elsewhere than usual. God held up two of the mighty towers for a half hour so that people in the lower floors could get out. And when he finally let go, he caused the towers to fall inward rather than to topple over, which would have killed so many more people. The foundations of the six surrounding buildings were demolished by the fall of the towers, but God held them up for many hours until all the occupants were safely evacuated, end quote. When thinking of 9-11, we tend to forget the thousands of miracles that occurred on that day. Hundreds of, of people were able to flee these buildings just in the nick of time. A handful of firemen and one civilian survived in this tiny space in a stairwell as one of the towers collapsed down around them. The passengers on flight 93 defeating the terrorists was a miracle in and of itself. Yes, September 11, my friends, was a horrible day, but we live in a terribly sinful Broken, problem-filled world. Sin reared its ugly head that day and, and caused the great devastations. So my church family, let's not forget about the sin that played a part in all of this. However, God, God is still in control. And his sovereignty is never to be doubted. Could God have prevented what happened on September 11? Of course he could. But he chose to allow the events to unfold exactly as they did. He prevented that day from being as bad as it could have been. And since September 11... Perhaps we should look at how many lives were actually changed as a result uh, for the better. How many people actually placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of what happened. Observe the words of Romans 8, 28. 
that should always be in our minds when we think of 9-11. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We need to look, friends, at the, the whole subject, the whole picture from a different perspective, one that we're just not too prone to take. In our minds, my friends, it's all about me. Woe is me, I hurt. I feel pain. I shouldn't have to suffer. If I hurt, if I suffer in any way, it's got to be somebody else's fault. It's certainly not mine. If God really loved me, he wouldn't let me suffer the way that I do. Isn't it, isn't it God's fault that I feel pain? And President Trump's fault? Am I right? Isn't that the attitude we seem to take? It's never my fault that I should suffer. Here's another truth I want us to recognize this morning. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a holy God. We've got to understand this, my friends, and, and know what it means. Our God is perfect in every way. I know that blows our minds because in contrast, we're not He's our creator. He doesn't experience everything like we do because he sits outside of time. He shouldn't have to suffer, but he sees all. He knows all. He, 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 I'm sure there's really no way that we're going to be able to fully understand or comprehend God's perspective, especially, especially when it comes to pain and suffering. Surely we can examine what we know about God and we must examine what we know and are sometimes unwilling to admit about ourselves. Honestly, we just feel that the pain that we experience is never justified, don't we? Deep inside... We know it's our fault. It's just not fair, we say. I'm a good person. I don't deserve pain and heartache. There's just one problem. I'm not a good person. Jesus said, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And here's the good news, my friends. You want some good news? Are you ready? The good news is God is not fair. God is not fair. And that's really great news. It's great news. Back to verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven are, heavens are above the earth... So great his love for those who fear him. For as far as the east is from the west, so far he has he removed our transgressions from us. If God was fair, I'd be toast. Amen. If God was fair, my sins would secure me a front row seat in hell. If the wages of sin are death and I'm a sinner, then that means I deserve what, church? Come on. If the wages of sin is death and I'm a sinner, then I deserve death. That's what I deserve. 
God is holy. That's who he is. We have broken his holy standard, his law. We deserve punishment. That's what we deserve. That's what God owes us. To die and suffer eternally would be fair punishment for our disobedience. But thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that you are not a fair God. He is just, but he's not fair. And because he is holy and pure, he must be a just God. Sin deserves punishment. And God cannot punish sin without punishing the sinner, the one who committed the sin. And because of our sin, we must die. And not just in the flesh, but spiritually and eternally, because God will never allow our sin into his holy presence. Understand that, folks. And because our God is a loving, a merciful, a gracious God, he sent his son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for our sins. Did Jesus deserve to take our punishment, God's wrath for our sins? No. Heavens, no. But that is the kind of God he is. And if we know Jesus as our personal, intimate relationship, as our Savior, our Lord, God won't give us what we deserve. When we get all wrapped up in what we deserve, let's stop for just a second to think about what, what's really fair. What do we really deserve? Thankfully, if we repent of our sin, and friends, that simply means turn away from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus, God will save us from our eternal death and he will give us eternal life. He spares us from death and gives us life. So remember, it is by his mercy that he spares us from what we do deserve and instead, by his grace, he gives us uh, life, what we don't deserve. Grace is amazing. Amen. amen. Now, let me ask you this. For those of you who would answer that God's grace is amazing, can you truthfully say that you completely understand it? Right? Do you, you really grasp all about God's love as, as what he does and, and, and uh, um, extends his grace to us the way he does? Believe me, friends, I surely can't figure it out. But I accept it. I, I graciously accept it. When we don't understand something, friends, about God, some people are attempt. Uh, att attempted to discredit him, right? But you don't have to really completely understand everything to believe in something. In John chapter 9, we're told that Jesus came upon a man who was uh, blind from birth. And Jesus' disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Now, for some reason, uh, we have this tendency to want to blame when something is wrong with us, right? Yet we live in this sinful, broken world where, where things will always be wrong until Jesus returns to us and restores everything back to right. So Jesus said, well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but... This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So just because God can, can use what happens in a sinful, broken world that we are a part of it, doesn't mean that he has caused it to happen. Listen once again to Romans 8, 28, where as we know that in all things, God works for, uh, for the good of those who... 
love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1.11 reminds us that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God will allow sinful people to cause chaos and tragedy, but it is us who causes it, not God. God can cause pain if he chooses to, but we do just fine by ourselves, thank you very much, without, when it comes to hurting one another. The 23rd Psalm reminds me that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for God is with me. His, his rod and staff, they comfort me. Oh, friends, when I depend upon God in my hour of darkness, he will be there with me to comfort me. We want to blame God for allowing us to bring pain upon ourselves and that he should prevent us from being so mean and ugly to one another. That we should blame God for allowing us to be sinful, broken people who are, by our own choice, have walked away from him. And yet God, in his goodness, promises to walk with us through the dark valleys of our lives. And if we depend upon God, instead of blaming him for being so unfair, then perhaps, my friends, we can enjoy a little bit of his light shining in on our darkest moments. Now, if you're hurting right now, I, I urge you to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus to come help you rather than curse his name for a fault that doesn't belong to him. These, there are people who have led a much rougher life than mine, and I've certainly made my share of mistakes. But this is the Lord I know. Verses 7 and 8, once more, he made known his ways to Moses. His deeds to the people of Israel, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. David was probably thinking of Exodus 34, 6 when he wrote that for Exodus 34, 6 says, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. But friends, not only do we find it there in Exodus 34 and Psalm 103, but we also find it in Nehemiah 9, 17. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked. And in their rebellion, appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are compassionate and gracious. God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Psalm 145, 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Joel 2, 13, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from, from sending calamity. I sure am glad our God is not a fair God, but one that is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Amen? Amen. Amen. One last scripture. Just write it down. You'll want to read this when you open up your Bibles at home. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10, Paul writes of himself saying, 
to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Oh, I love the mountaintops of my life so much more than the deep valleys, don't you? But you know what? It is in the valleys that I find myself walking closer to God. And I don't look forward to trials, but I know they're going to come regardless. You know, because we just live in that sinful, broken, fallen world. I'm just so grateful, so grateful to walk in the, that I don't have to walk in those valleys alone. God is faithful and loving, and he is with me when, church? Always. Always. So it's in these trials that I have discovered to find that his grace is made perfect in my weakness. And we must remember that it is not God's pity that saves us, but God's grace. For God's grace is love that has paid a price. Were it not for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, there would be no forgiveness of my sin and your sin. Yes, God is a tender loving father but it isn't his but his pity isn't some shallow sentimental feeling a holy God demands that his law be satisfied and only his perfect holy son Jesus could provide that satisfaction sometimes the pain in our life it just seems so great we just want to blame someone else. And so we blame God. God isn't to blame for the condition of the world. Man is. Since Adam and Eve, mankind is, is responsible for the condition of the world. Now we think that God's responsibility is to protect us from pain and suffering and that he's not good. And God wants us to rely upon him in our time of pain so that he may comfort us and get us through the worst of our pain. Once again, verse 13 and 14, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed and he remembers that we are dust. Join me in prayer, would you please? Heavenly Father, as we humbly bow our hearts and perhaps even our bodies in your holy presence here today, I pray that we have come to understand something about you we never knew before. For whatever means it may be, I'm reaching out to someone here today, to someone who will view this uh, service online to realize I've learned something new about you, God. I am a sinner who desperately needs you. I need a savior. And so for that person here today that, Lord, you have touched a nerve, I 
I invite them to pray along with me with all sincerity of heart. Jesus, I'm a sinner who deserves death and wrath for my sins. But I believe and I trust that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. And so I pray that you have mercy on me. I am a sinner who needs your forgiveness. Please forgive me. I believe that what you did on the cross was for me. I trust that you are my savior. Please save me from my sins. I humbly surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus. I trust in you to save me. I believe that you ascended into heaven and will return one day. And Lord, I need your spirit living in me so that I may surrender completely to your lordship and live my life for you. The value of my life is given by you. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that kind of prayers, that sentiment from your heart, I want to support and encourage you. And so whether you're still watching online or whether you're here in the congregation, let me just invite you in a very unique, unusual way in COVID times, just give me a connection card, would you? Put your name on it and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you about a prayer that you led me in. And let me uh, have a conversation with you. If you're online, go to the website, fbcbh.com. There is a contact the pastor box right there on the first page. 